This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. This Monday, Memorial Day, marks the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, one of the single greatest acts of racist terror in U.S. history. In 1921, the thriving African-American neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was known as Black Wall Street for its concentration of successful black-owned businesses before it was burned to the ground by a white mob. The violence grew from confrontation at the Tulsa courthouse, where whites had gathered to abduct and lynch a jailed black man who had been wrongfully accused of assaulting a white woman. Black residents of Greenwood arrived to stop the lynching. Gunshots erupted, after which the white mob set upon Greenwood for 18 hours of mass murder, arson and looting that would become known as the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. An estimated 300 African Americans were killed, over 1,000 injured. 10,000 were left homeless as the racist mob, some of them deputized and armed by Tulsa law enforcement, along with members of the Ku Klux Klan, terrorized the black population. Airplanes were used to drop dynamite and crude incendiary bombs on Greenwood, ultimately burning over 35 city blocks. Over 1,200 homes were destroyed, along with countless businesses. The actual number of dead will never be known, as bodies were tossed into mass graves or thrown in the river. Last week, a House Judiciary subcommittee held a hearing to address the ongoing impacts of the Tulsa massacre. Three African-American survivors testified in favor of reparations. Viola Fletcher, her younger brother, Hughes Van Ellis, who's 100 years old, and 105-year-old Lessie Benningfield Randall. This is part of their testimony, beginning with Viola Fletcher. I'm a survivor of the Tulsa race massacre. Two weeks ago, I celebrated my 107th birthday. <laughs> Today, I'm visiting Washington, D.C. for the first time in my life. I'm here seeking justice, and I'm asking my country to acknowledge what happened in Tulsa in 1921. The night of the massacre, I was awakened by my family. My parents and five siblings were there. I was told we had to leave, and that was it. I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men seeing being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Our country may forget this history, but I cannot. I will not, and other survivors do not, and our descendants do not. We live with it every day, and the thought of what Greenwood was, was and what it could have been. We aren't just black and white pictures on a screen. We are flesh and blood. I was there when it happened. I'm still here. That's right. It seems like justice in America is always so slow are not possible for black people. Three African-American survivors of the Tulsa race massacre making history as they testified before Congress just ahead of the centennial of the race massacre this Monday. The Department of Homeland Security has said events commemorating the massacre could be a target for white supremacists. President Joe Biden still plans to travel to Tulsa on Tuesday. This Sunday, a documentary by award-winning filmmaker Stanley Nelson premieres on the History Channel. This is the trailer for Tulsa Burning, the 1921 race massacre. The destruction was so complete. The suffering was so biblical. The betrayal was so profound. Black communities deserve the opportunity to confront the past. Our city has been stuck since then. Yeah. We've never recovered. Tulsa was the best place in the nation for African Americans. They have everything from hotels, theaters. Doctors, lawyers. People refer to it as Black Wall Street. 
showing black people that a new world was possible. The Tribune published a story titled Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. It was a false narrative to keep black people in their place, to reinforce white supremacy. All across Tulsa, angry whites are now organizing. They get their guns, they get their torches. At that point, they start moving towards Greenwood. All hell broke loose. My mother says the white folks are killing the colored folks. Firing into homes. Bombs dropping from the air. It was just an all-out massacre. Not one of those men who participated in the race massacre were ever brought to justice. The Tulsa Tribune refused to write anything about the massacre for more than 50 years. Victims were being buried in unmarked graves across the city. The reason we understand the history of the massacre is that certain survivors decided to talk about it. My mother saw four men coming toward our house, and all of them had torches. We would be looking for the remains of those who were lost so tragically. This is so beautiful and sad at the same time. We need to do something about what happened in Tulsa. There cannot be any justice to there is proper respect, restitution, and repair. The trailer for Tulsa Burning, the 1921 race massacre. The executive producer of the film, NBA star Russell Westbrook, who played for the Oklahoma City Thunder for over a decade. We're joined now by one of the documentary's directors, Stanley Nelson. His previous films include Freedom Summer, Freedom Riders, The Murder of Emmett Till. Uh, Stanley, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's an honor to have you with us again. Um, Lay this out. I mean, this is a story that, as we can see throughout this film and, of course, from our own education, was so suppressed for so many decades. Go back in time. Talk to us about Black Wall Street and why so many African Americans came to Oklahoma. Yeah, I think one of the things that's so fascinating about the story is that African Americans in the decades after the Civil War uh, migrated west. You know, we think of that famous saying, go west, young man. Well, African Americans went west. You know, we think about Americans in covered wagons. We don't think about, usually think about African Americans, but African Americans went uh, west in, in covered wagons, on horseback, on foot, uh, to try to start a new life and try to start a, a life with, that they could live uh, with dignity and peace. And they did that, and they did that in, in, in Greenwood, and, and Greenwood was one of over 100 uh, African-American communities in the West, uh, some small, some a little larger. But Greenwood was the biggest and the baddest of those communities. It was a very, very successful uh, communities that com a community that had businesses, you know, uh, a skating rink, movie theaters, grocery stores, lawyers, doctors, everything. It was really a self-contained community. And that may have been one of the problems um, with uh, their white neighbors. Yeah, I was so struck by the history where you talked about African Americans coming north from the oppression of the Deep South. And actually, a number of them—they called it Indian country going to Oklahoma. A number concerned about Oklahoma becoming a state, that it would reinforce the racist laws of the rest of the United States. Yeah, one of the things that's so fascinating is that, you know, Oklahoma was a territory, and so it was kind of free. You know, it was the home of the land rush. Uh, and, and black people took, took part of that, took part in that. And there was a move to make Oklahoma kind of a home, a black state for African Americans. Um, but once Oklahoma became a state, then the racist Jim Crow laws took effect, and, and black people that had kind of been uh, free in Oklahoma were then persecuted. This is another clip from your documentary, Tulsa Burning, that features several historians and descendants describing Greenwood's history as the Black Wall Street. Greenwood was a community of necessity. It was a segregated enclave. Uh, black folks couldn't apply their trades or purchase goods and services in the larger white community, so they created their own economy. 
That economy became successful because black folks did business with one another and kept dollars largely in the black community. What happens in Greenwood is that segregation which is not necessarily desired, segregation actually enables black businesses to thrive, black professionals to thrive. It was a district where, in fact, money, dollars, could turn over five or six times. In Greenwood, you could, um, as a black person, uh, you could advance. Um, and you had a number of individuals in the community that were prospering. My uncle, he was a physician. His name was Andrew Jackson. Lived up on Detroit Street in the 500 block, sort of a hill right up that street. Detroit in those days had the nicest houses. The Negroes did. The principal of the school lived up there. We had dentists up there. We had wonderful doctors. And my uncle, I told you his name was Dr. Jackson. My great-grandfather's name was J.B. Stradford. He grew up in Kentucky. His parents were slaves. He was able to get a law degree, um, go to Oberlin College, and really start his entrepreneurial career in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Stratford Hotel was one of the largest black-owned hotels in the United States. It was a beautiful building, and leaders from throughout the country, when they came through the Midwest, would often stay uh, at the Stratford Hotel. You have black entertainers that are playing there. Jazz being a really important scene. We think about jazz in, in, in Kansas, in Kansas City. It's also important in Greenwood. Because of the success of Greenwood, Booker T. Washington coined the phrase uh, Greenwood as the Black Wall Street, or the Negro Wall Street of America. A clip from Tulsa Burning that's going to air on History Channel on Sunday. Um, Stanley Nelson, talk about why you chose to take on this subject to add to your remarkable opus of work. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's more reasons than one. One, it, it's a, it's an incredible American story that, that needs to be known. You know, the building of, of Black Wall Street, the building of Greenwood, and also the devastation and destruction. But also, it was really challenging because we're telling two stories at once, so we're also telling the story of uh, 2020, 2021, as uh, Greenwood searches uh, for the remains of African-Americans who were uh, buried in mass graves unmarked. Um, and we didn't know what we, what we would find or what they would find. And so we're telling the story of 1921 uh, in, of Greenwood and also 2021 in, in Greenwood. And, of course, 2020, because when Trump went on the 99th anniversary of Tulsa, so much was raised. I want to go to another clip from your documentary, Tulsa Burning, of Reverend Robert Turner of the Vernon AME Church on Greenwood Avenue in Tulsa, the only surviving structure from behind, before the massacre. When I came to Pastor Vernon Church in Tulsa, I knew nothing about the history of this church. One of my trustees gave me a tour, and when I saw the cornerstone outside, and the cornerstone is still there, it reads, Basement Erected 1919. I said, is that the same one we have? He said, yes, that's the same basement that you just walked through. So it survived 1921 race mask. He was like, yes. I was like, do you know what this is? He was like, well, I said, we, we have something left, right? All is not lost. And nearly 100 years after the Tulsa Race Massacre, a team of scholars is working to uncover the unmarked graves that uh, Stanley Nelson just referred to, of victims with hopes of identifying some of their bodies. In this clip of Tulsa Burning, we hear from Brenda Nails Alford, a descendant of James and Henry Nails, who own businesses in Black Wall Street. I always knew that my grandmother had to hide in a church for some reason, but I never knew what that meant. Family members would come to town, my great uncles would come to town, and maybe we'd be uh, driving around and we would pass Oaklawn Cemetery. Someone in the car would always say, you know they're still over there, the victims of the race massacre. And everybody in the car would agree. 
and I always had a little thing about that cemetery growing up as a kid because I was like, what's over there? And I would find out so many, many years later that the family member and community members were there. But in 1921, the people who were killed, people who lost lives, loved ones, they never had the benefit of having a funeral. That touches me at the core, and it should any conscious human being. The fact that we just dump bodies of human beings, of patriots, of veterans, of teachers, of husbands, of wives, children in mass graves. Nobody ever had a chance to say goodbye. That last voice, Reverend Robert Turner of Tulsa's Vernon AME Church. Stanley Nelson, what most surprised you as you did this research? I think one of the things that was so surprising is that there's film footage of the building of Tulsa. You know, the, the, the people were so prosperous and, and, and so proud of what they were building that in, you know, 1920, you know, early in 1921, they made movies and took pictures of, of, of their homes and their businesses, and, and that's really rare. And there's also uh, still pictures and movies of the destruction. So that so that we see it, and so you know, as a, as a filmmaker, it was um, it was a gift because it's really a window into what happened, um, and and that really surprised me because you don't often find uh, film footage of, of just African American communities, you know, being themselves uh, from the early twenties. This is another clip um, from Tulsa burning. It features Brenda Nails Alfred, it's descendant of James and Henry Nails. Of victimization. It's also a story of resistance. It's also a story of courage and resilience, and that can't be forgotten. My grandfather, he was a very proud, college-educated shoemaker who did everything he was, quote-unquote, supposed to do. He got his education. He worked hard. He started the businesses. And still, that wasn't enough. And so in this day and time, my question is, when is it enough? When are we enough as a people? They did everything that they could do. They wanted to be successful. These were proud, upstanding members of our community who simply wanted a piece of the American dream and truly received a nightmare. At the end of this experience, no white person was convicted of an offense related to killing people or destroying the property in the Greenwood District. None. And that is not surprising. I mean, really, you know, when you think about the context, it's not surprising at all. That last voice, historian Hannibal Johnson. And finally, this clip from Tulsa Burning about the aftermath of the deadly attack. They're being led away at gunpoint to these so-called internment centers around town, the fairgrounds, the municipal auditorium, uh, the baseball park. To get out of these centers, people generally had to have a green identification card countersigned by a white person that was willing to vouch for them. So here you are, you've been illegally arrested by white civilians. You have no idea what's happened to your loved ones if you've been separated from them. If that was your uncle, your brother, your son, your father, you're going to never know what happened to them. acknowledge that the, the destruction to the community was intentional, it was conscious, it was systematic. When the dust settled, somewhere between 100 and 300 people were killed. 
At least 1,250 homes in the black community were destroyed. 35 square blocks, 36 square blocks, 40 square blocks, just obliterated it. You could see the iron, you know, metal bed stands where there used to be homes. $2 million in black wealth went up in flames, right? That was never recouped. And for people who didn't know what happened to their loved ones, identified as well as unidentified African-American massacre victims were being buried in unmarked graves across the city. Yet another clip from Tulsa burning. Stanley Nelson, as we wrap up, the issue of reparations 100 years later. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things the film does and, and, and does so well is it makes you think about reparations. You know, it's such a fraught word, but I think that you understand what people mean and why people ask for reparations um, once you see the film and know the story of Tulsa, which is a real representation of, of the problems um, that black communities suffered through. And you certainly help us do this in this remarkable documentary. Stanley Nelson, the award-winning director of the new documentary Tulsa Burning, the 1921 Race Massacre, premieres Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern on the History Channel. And that does it for our show. Our condolences to our dear colleague Miriam Barnard. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay safe.